Hello, everyone. Just getting here right now. Happy Saturday. I just realized I forgot my coffee upstairs and it's too late. There'll be no coffee for me right now. Good morning. Hi, Andrea. Thanks for chiming in first. As everybody's just kind of getting in here. Monica from South Africa. What time is it in South Africa right now? Because it's a little early here. I did a little early one this time. So we're here at 930 in Michigan. Um, what time is it in South Africa? Jane in San Diego. I know it's 630 a.m. where you are. So thanks for getting up early with us. Cleo says, go get coffee. Why? You don't think I have enough energy without it? I am very tempted to go get it. My kids um, desperately want to be down in my basement right now. And I said, no, you have to stay up there. Otherwise, I would send them to go get my coffee. Um, okay, so it's 3.30 in the afternoon in South Africa. So that's, that's good. You're not getting up too early. Jane's got the coffee brewing. Good morning, Tracy in Alabama. Billy in Las Vegas. Oh, from Las Vegas, New Mexico in Arizona. Hey, Billy, nice to see you again. Um, Madeline in Greenville, South Carolina. Beautiful. Uh, we've got Lucia in Rome, Italy. I just, I, can we just, can we just pause and say how awesome it is that we get to like hang out with people around the world pretty much whenever we want. Uh, it's still a miracle to me. Uh, Mandy Dealman. Hey, Mandy. Uh, Mandy is my son's beloved kindergarten teacher and I'm thrilled you're here too. Uh, coming at us from the other side of town. Um, hi, Kevin from Alberta. Robin from Chicago. I'm not going to do this all day, but I just I just get a thrill out of the fact that we've got people from all over the place, local and from far away. Ventura, is that California? I only know about Ventura Boulevard, Brian. Uh, friends from Kansas, Canada, South Carolina. I lived in Columbia, South Carolina for a while, Amanda. Um, hi, Thanasis from Greece. This is weird. I love it. All right. Well, feel free to just keep chiming in where you're from because I think we're all getting a kick out of it, or at least I am. Um, yeah, Brian's from California. California, beautiful place. Haven't been there since the lockdown. So let's start with that. Um, before we get into talking about virtual meetings, because I just wanted to have a little chat with you all this morning. Um, I often do little weekend um, Facebook lives where we just kind of talk something about teaching and I thought we'd bring it here in the webinar space which is a little bit more um, put together I guess I can have a slideshow but then we can still talk and chat so uh, I, I thought we would do that this morning but before we get into that I would love to just spend a few minutes checking in with teachers with educators wherever you are which it seems to be all over the place Aman is from India I can't get enough of this Sharon in Michigan woo we are one of the four lockdown states. Um, Elena from Colombia again. Hello again. Hey, if you were here at my last webinar, um, thanks for coming back. And if, if you're new to it, um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I hope it can be a useful little bit of time together. Um, my name is Trevor, and I have been a high school teacher, middle school, uh, teaching in higher ed. Um, I also write a, I also like to research and learn from other teachers and write books. Um, and so I'm a bit of an author too, and I make videos and, uh, I just, my whole life is, uh, is just head first in the whole world of education. Um, and this whole world is getting upended right now, along with the rest of the world too. But, you know, if you're a teacher anywhere, whether it's in the, the, the Western hemisphere or on the other side of the world, um, you are facing some unique challenges right now. You are being forced to rethink what it means to connect with your students and how to conduct your classroom and how to hold yourself accountable. And, and you are dealing with a brand new schedule and a whole new set of challenges, whether it's balancing work and life or, you know, trying to be an effective teacher who's present and doing all of the right things. And yet you've got your own kids stomping upstairs or begging for your time, or maybe you're teaching your kids. You know, you're, you're still in charge of their education, but then you have you're in charge of your own students' education. And it's overwhelming and it's a lot. And we don't know when it's going to end. Right. We don't know when it's going to end. I remember when my son's 
school was canceled that first day. He had no idea he wasn't going to see his friends the rest of the year. He didn't know he was going to, he wasn't going to get to see his teacher who he just desperately loves the rest of the year. It was just a surprise out of nowhere. Um, and we thought, you know, when it first happened, like, oh, maybe we're going to be out of school for a week or two weeks or three weeks. And, oh, it's going to be the whole month. Oh, it's going to be the rest of the school year. And then now there's murmurs of, are we even going to be back in school in the fall? Um, and so there's a lot of unknowns still. And I'm hoping personally that we are. I, I think we all are. Um, but we don't know. And and so I think right now we're still trying to figure out how do we make the most out of our time now with our students? Um, but then we're going to hopefully most of us, I don't know where everybody, what it looks like for you on the other parts of the world, but most of us are going to have a summer break here, a holiday, a vacation. Um, and we might be diving right back into this virtual classroom again in August or September or whatever it is. We don't know. We don't know. And so I think we need to keep having conversations about wellness and keeping yourself sane and giving yourself grace and and trying to learn how to do this successfully together uh, because it might be going on for a while. Um, and then I also think we need to keep diving in to uh, professional development wherever we can and learning how do we work effectively in a, in a virtual space? How do we have successful virtual meetings? How, what does assessment look like? What does student engagement look like? You know, this, uh, and I'll just be completely forthright with you, this uh, conversation we're gonna have today is really for students who have access to a virtual space. Um, we're gonna talk about how do we have successful Zoom meetings or whatever video platform Skype that you use. How do we do that successfully? But let's be honest, there's a lot of students who don't have access. You know, there's a major equity issue in our world when it comes to education and kids having access to the things that they need. You know, my son is able to chime in and talk to his classmates and talk to his teacher and stay connected in that way. My daughter, who's a preschooler, is getting to do the same thing. You know, a four-year-old is getting to go on her mom or dad's laptop and chat with her teacher and get still get some instruction, still get some connections, still build relationships. And that's beautiful. What a privilege, though because there's a lot of students who don't have access to this. And so I think what we're learning right now is we're learning how do we still reach and connect with those students, with all of our students. Um, but then also I think we're learning that, yeah, this is shining, shining a spotlight on equity issues in education in general, right? Like this is actually showing a problem that, that already existed before the lockdown and now it's just being magnified more and more. And so I think this is challenging a lot of us in the, the system as, as a whole to really think about how are we going to make school better than it was before the coronavirus pandemic, right? How are we gonna make it a better place, a better system, a more equitable system, a more effective system afterwards? And so I think all of these conversations we're having are not just to survive the short term, but instead, how do we make it seep in to regular life when we get back there? Which I will keep saying, I've been saying it for months and I'll say it again, we will get back to some normalcy. We will not be in this space forever. We will get to connect with our students one-on-one -on -one again. It's not gonna have to just be through the camera on a computer um, or a social distance drive by. You know, We're still gonna be able to connect again. And I think that time is coming sooner than a lot of people think, but I could be wrong, but it will come. So let's hold on to that hope and let's dive in uh, to just getting better and just growing and learning new things. Um, I would love for this to be a conversation today. I've just got some basic ideas and I wanna share out, um, but this, this chat space, this chat bar is a great place for people to contribute. The last time we did a webinar, um, people had some great ideas and I know people were going through and just taking note of links that people had or ideas. Um, I'm going to try to capture as much as I can of it. I still haven't been able to figure out how to download um, everything in the comment bar, uh, but feel free um, to just kind of share out and, and contribute. And, and I want to create some spaces for it as well. So let's dive into talking about making the most of virtual meetings with your students. And I have to do it without coffee because it's upstairs. And we've got people from India and Australia and Canada and, and Alger Heights in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who don't want to wait while I go get coffee. So here we go. All right. Uh, we've already, oh, if you want to connect with me, by the way, um, here's some places that you can do that. You can check out my website. I would love to just chat with you. So feel free to get in touch there. You can also follow me on Facebook. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram here. Um, 
Twitter, and then my YouTube channel. So I make a lot of videos uh, for educators and teachers and professionals. And um, so feel free to follow me on there as well and subscribe. Uh, what are people saying over here? Education will not only be attained in the building for our students, but will also include virtual school. Yeah, I think a lot of us are going to be going into this hybrid model for a while. Um, and so I think all that we're doing now is going to help prepare us for whatever come next comes next. All right. Um, let's do this. I think we've established where everybody's from. I'll skip that. All right. Let's talk about virtual meetings. Um, if you're on here, I'm guessing that you are having some form of virtual meetings with your students. You're, you're opening up your laptop and having chats with them. And let's just kind of get some of the cats out of the bag right now. I don't know if that's a proper term, but um, virtual meetings can be difficult. They can be laden with distraction. Uh, you can't force your students to come to them, right? You don't have control over your students' schedules when they're not in your classroom. You can't compel them to be there. You can't compel their parents to make them open up the laptop and be there. You can't control the busyness of their lives that's happening outside of school and make them come to virtual meetings. And that's a challenge. You know, that's a difficult thing. I'll just be completely honest. You know, this week uh, on Thursday, we had a really busy day and we had family. My, my in-laws were coming back in town and we had this whole bunch of stuff going on. And my son just missed his virtual meeting on Thursday. And we felt like garbage about it because he loves it and he needs it and we just missed it and and I you might have had students who missed their meetings and you might be scratching your head and wondering why aren't they showing up to these zoom chats is there something that we're not doing right is, is there something that I'm not planning am I not letting them know what is it and I just think the truth is we have to realize we only have so much control over attendance right now because there's so many different factors at play um, and so I think we should start off by saying that when we are holding virtual meetings we can do our very best to um, encourage our students to be there. We can do our very best to incentivize them to be there, give them a good reason to be there, make it a worthwhile experience. But you have to know that uh, all you can do is can kind of present that opportunity and make students aware, um, but you can't control it, right? It's, it's not um, all in your hands there. Um, and so we have to be aware of that and uh, give ourselves some grace in that area. Uh, but these meetings that we do have, uh, when they are available to students, I, I think there is so much value out of it. You know, when I was in high school, there was no such thing as virtual classrooms, right? And, and that was getting to be a while ago, but not that long ago. And, and yet, you know, I mean, what is it, 18 years ago? Uh, uh, 17 years ago. 17. But, you know, when I had a hurricane hit my town and, and we were out of school for a month, and it knocked my house over, my school over, and it was this big time of disruption. There's no connecting before that. I didn't get to see what my teachers were up to. I didn't get to see my friends in a virtual space. I wasn't able to continue my learning in any way possible. And so now that we have this technology, I think we really need to lean into it and embrace it because it, it, there really is some amazing things that can happen in a virtual space. And I will say, this is my own personal opinion, so nobody come after me um, if you are a strictly online teacher and you believe very strongly in it, which I think you can and you should, and I think there's value in it. I don't think that a virtual classroom space will ever replace one or in-classroom meetings. I, I, I personally don't think that. I think that there's such an energy exchange when we're with students in person, and there's ways of diving deeper and getting to have a one-on-one -on -one connection, and there's more collaboration that can occur in a, in a communal space that is school. So I just want to throw that out there, but I do think there's value that we can, we can attain in virtual meetings, and that's what I really want to talk about. So let's dig in a little bit. Uh, virtual meetings, I think that they should be about these three things. I think one, they are a wonderful opportunity for relationship building. This is a space where we can maintain connectiveness with our students. Um, two is introducing concepts, big ideas. This is where like if you have your whole class in a, in a Zoom meeting space, you can introduce a big idea for them to explore further in activities that you have planned. Um, and then three, small group instruction. The, the Zoom meeting, I'll use Zoom. I don't know what platform you use, but I'll just say Zoom a bunch if that just makes it easier. Um, the Zoom space, you can get into the nitty gritty of instruction, um, but I think that has to happen in a much smaller group than a whole group. You know, you wouldn't want to give 
a one hour presentation to your entire class in a Zoom space. That's at least with K-12 students, you will lose their attention. Heck, even with my college students, I, I only have their attention for so long. Um, and so we're gonna talk more about the direct instruction side of things in just a little bit. But one, relationship building, two, introducing broad concepts to an entire class, and then three, getting to do small group instruction. So let's talk about those. All right, let's talk about classroom management. This is one that I think most teachers are really struggling with in the Zoom space, understandably so. How do you manage students if they're not in front of you? If, 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 you're, if you, a lot of the tools that we had beforehand to manage our classroom um, are no longer available to us. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to give a teacher look at a, at a specific student when there's only like a little hole on the top of our laptop that we're looking into, right? We can't use that in the same way. You know, we, we might have, you know, maybe one of the things that you were able to do is you incentivize students. You know what I mean? Like I know my son has, um, what are they called? Pride tickets. You know, they were like these tickets that they can get for of the right kind of behavior and then they can be used use those to go and win a prize later on it's just some type of system that uh that his school and his teacher uses to kind of incentivize things and it really works for some students not all but you know that system worked for my son i can speak i can tell you and yet that's out the out the door and so how do we manage students in this virtual space um so i just want to present a few ideas but then i would love for anybody else um to chime in as well um uh, I think one thing that we should be doing every single time that we have a whole, grass, whole class meeting or even a small group meeting is to regularly revisit classroom norms. You know what I mean? Like the norms that we created in the regular classroom, um, which, you know, be respectful of others. Uh, uh, I won't speak over somebody else. Um, I will raise my hand to speak. Whatever those norms that you've ha already had established in the physical space, those can still exist now, right? Those are still yours. This is still your classroom. Like this is still yours. It might look different. It might not be what you want it to be, but it's still your space. It's still your student space. You know, something that I've always had my students do is we create our norms together. We'll create class contracts and we'll go through and we'll talk about what does a successful classroom environment look like. And we list out all of the things that we want to see in our classroom. And I let them really have the control over that. And I know what I want it to look like, but I direct a conversation for they for them to really come up with what some, are some things that we can all stack hands and agree on as a class to make this class look like. And then we write it up on a contract and all my students sign it. And that's our way of saying, okay, we all agree that these are norms for our room. So my students come up with that. You might do something very similar to this. Um, and so let those norms still be a part of your virtual space. If you haven't done this yet, maybe have just a class meeting with your students about what some of those norms are. You know what I mean? And let them come up with it. Hey guys, if we're going to have Zoom meetings like this a couple times a week, what are some things that we can all stack hands on and agree on that what are some norms that can make this successful for everybody? And then let them come up with it and have somebody record it and write it down. And then every time we meet with students, let's just revisit those norms. Maybe you wouldn't revisit them every single time you start class in a physical space. Um, but these are more spread out for most of us. We're not meeting with the same students every single day. And this is new for them, too. Right. This is new for you. And this is new for them. And so we want to set them up for success as well and uh, really just kind of help reinforce some of the things that we're looking for. Um, Stephanie says, we ask our students to turn on their camera but mute their mics. Yeah, that's, so what's your thinking behind that, Stephanie? I'd love to hear more about that because I, I thought my next slide said mute, mute their mics. Um, so that's it. Yeah, so muting their mics uh, but asking them to have their cameras on. Yeah, there's just some accountability there is having students, you know, being able to see them, seeing that they're engaged. Um, I think one of the things that we have to think about when asking them to have cameras on is do they have a space that they're not embarrassed to share? You know what I mean? Like, it, it, are there issues of what's going on behind them that they might not want everyone to be able to see? And so we, I think we do have to think through those kind of things about using cameras. Um, what else are we saying? It's really hard to have a chat when I can't see them, Tiffany says. They don't all have a space that they want to share with others. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think these are just kind of the things that we have to work through and figure out. You know, maybe if this goes on longer, maybe one of the things we ask students is, you know, if you are doing a chat, 
you've got to find a space in front of a white wall or, or a blank wall or something like that and just kind of create a blanket rule for everybody that you have to do it in front of a, of a, in front of a common space to kind of be a little bit of an equalizer. But I don't know. I haven't really put too much thought into that. But, um, yeah, that's a challenge. Using vir virtual background on Zoom is a great idea that Billy just shared. Um, yeah, it, I don't know if, if everybody's using Zoom, um, but there's just some great technology out there where they can create their own virtual background um, and just have them set that up and have some parameters for what that looks like, obviously, but creating uh, you know some commonality for what's behind them. I think that's a fantastic idea. So, but whatever it is, um, revisit those classroom norms. And I wanna go over a few norms that I would have. Um, but whatever those are is kind of just remind them every single day, hey friends, before we uh, dive into talking about whatever we're gonna be talking about, let's all remember what we came up with together. Uh, we all keep our microphones on Zoom. Um, uh, we are all committed to being on task. Um, these Zoom meetings are not gonna be too long and I'm keeping them short so that we can maximize our engagement. And so in the time that we are all on, that we wanna all be engaged together. Um, whatever those those norms are is revisit, revisiting them regularly. Um, also sharing your agenda every single meeting. I think the problem with Zoom meetings is they're very easy to get longer than you intended them uh, to be. You know, I think we've all been in staff meetings ourselves where just people start talking and it starts going on tangents. And sometimes, you know, it'll turn into like mini breakouts, like where two people are having a discussion and everybody else in the squares are just sitting there waiting for the conversation to get moving or to go somewhere else. And, and everybody else is wondering, where is this going? And I think students are feeling the exact same thing. What exactly am I supposed to be getting out of this Zoom meeting? What makes it worth it? Why, why, why should I be cutting out time in the middle of the day uh, to go and, and chime into this. And so sharing a, an agenda every single day saying, hey, here's what we're gonna accomplish today. Um, I wanna talk about this. I wanna have a small group discussion for 10 minutes about this, and then I'll answer any questions and then you'll be gone. You know what I mean? And then you can move on to the next thing. Um, so sharing uh, an agenda every single day. Let's, let's see, Crystal had a great idea. We send out a Google form before the meeting for students to submit questions that we can answer in the meeting. That way students don't feel the pressure or embarrassment of asking in front of friends. That's a fantastic idea, Crystal. Yeah, I mean, we've got to realize this. The other thing about video is it can be intimidating. You know, not all of us are used to being in front of a camera all the time. This is something I have to remind myself with my own students because I'm on cameras all the time. I make videos all the time. For the longest time, I hated hearing my own voice. I hated seeing myself, but I've just gotten used to it because I've done it so much. Most of our students don't have that same type of familiarity or that comfortability. A lot of you might not. You know, as, as a teacher, you might be used to in-person presence, but being on video might be something that you're not exactly excited about doing. Um, and so, yeah, I think we have to keep that in mind as well. I love the idea of sending out a Google form and, you know, asking students beforehand, hey, if you have specific questions, ask them on here. Um, otherwise, you can ask in, on the camera, uh, but you don't have to. So kind of removing that barrier a bit. Love that. Um, what else? Anything else? No texting friends during class meetings. It's a good norm. And I think if you can get students to agree to it, uh, that's beautiful. But the monitoring it or um, enforcing that rule, I think, is a different challenge. Um, but, but I think, I th I think it, it is a good thing that we have as teachers, um, I think is in here. I'm going to skip one. Use, we have at least the ability to use the mute button. So if there is a student who uh, is distracting others or he's talking out of turn too much, you do have the ability to mute. Um, and I think we have to do it respectfully or at least explain to students like, hey, if I ever have to use the mute button, know that it's not because I don't like you. It's not because I'm necessarily even mad at you. It's that this is hard enough to be able to teach and have engaging Zoom meetings, and we have to limit any type of distraction that there is. So maybe you're in a really loud environment and that's coming through to the other 30 people or 20 people who are on this Zoom meeting. And so I have to reserve the right to mute you um, if it uh, is becoming a distraction for everybody else. And I think it's just about being forthright about that, you know, be, allowing yourself to use these buttons. Um, you know, I think another one, let's see, uh, control screen sharing and commenting. You know, we, we have the ability to control some of this uh, digital usage if you're using some of these tools. Um, feel free to use them, uh, but also explain why you use them. Not necessarily every time, but make students aware like, hey, 
I've got to protect this space for everybody, just like you normally do, by the way. In a normal classroom, it's a space. One of your jobs as a teacher is to protect the learning environment for everyone. And you've got to do the same thing on here. And so you have to feel this, this responsibility and, and, and the permission to control screen sharing and commenting and, and, make, and reserve the right to mute people, reserve the right to remove people from meetings, to remove kids from meetings if it's creating a problem. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I know that late arrivals to meetings can be a distraction. If, you know, if everybody's going and then all of a sudden somebody pops in and, and it's just like, and it distracts everybody, you can lock meetings after they start. Um, you know, you can just say, hey, the meeting starts at nine. And if you're not there at nine, it's locked. And you could record, and we'll talk about this later, but you can record your meetings and say, hey, if you're late, you do still have access to the video. And so I'm still making sure everybody has access, which again is another equity issue. Some students might not be able to make it to your virtual meetings. Uh, they might not be able to get there on time. They might be at daycare. They might be um, watching their younger siblings, whatever it looks like, and they can't be at your meetings. Um, but that doesn't mean late arrivals, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily um, allow big distractions all the time because of these issues. Instead, I think we have to plan to uh, support those students elsewhere, uh, which could be recording meetings and, and making, you know, having office time available where you can schedule time with those kids or they can talk to you. Um, but I do think we have to protect the space of our students and, uh, and limit these distractions. And there's some great tools in this technology that we're using to really help us do that. Uh, Cami asked, what are some social emotional activities that we're doing? Um, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, actually. So we'll get to that very shortly. Um, oh, I love this. Ingrid says, have jobs for students during meetings like timekeeper or recorder. Um, I love that. I think that's a fantastic idea. You know, giving students tasks so they're not just listeners, but they're participants. That is a fantastic idea. Um, Audio and visual should always be choice, says Christine, especially if you're recording and posting it so others could not attend and view later. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I think recording, I think there's these logistical things we have to think about. Um, but at least, at the very least, they can hear or see you um, and, and what you're talking about to make sure that they still have access uh, to stuff. Okay. Um, let's, let's keep moving. What time we got? 9.56. All right. So, yep. Use these tools. Um, also don't feel pressure to respond to comments all the way, all the time, right away. Uh, I, j I just think this is another part of that we, in the virtual space is, you know, we feel this pressure like, oh, we always have to, to meet students whenever they need it. And I think it, that just, it derails you too much. You know, if you're trying to explain something complex and you're doing it in a space like this and maybe students aren't gonna be able to chime in, maybe they're writing in a comment bar or something like this, I don't feel like you have to feel the pressure to respond right away. I think in this virtual space, it's important to get into these flows and what you're talking about um, or whatever you're working on. And, and I just think you need to make sure students are just aware like, hey, I do wanna get to all of your comments, but I can tell you that I can't get to them right away. And so if you need to chime in, feel free to push the raise your hand button or leave a comment or whatever it is. Um, just know that I can't necessarily respond to all of it right away. And again, this is just about you as well. You know, this is hard and you've got to be able to create space for yourself um, to thrive in this work um, and, and not feel all of these pressures that you might be feeling um, right now as we're learning how to do this. Because it's overwhelming, by the way. It's overwhelming. Jane says, I'm overwhelmed by the number of emails. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and it's easy to get overwhelmed in a space like this. Even right now for me, I mean, can I be honest with you? I'm looking at hundreds of comments over here on the right, and they are all solid gold. Like there is so many things that I just simply don't have time to read all right now. And that's why I got to find a way to print all of this out so I can send it to you. Um, but it, it can feel overwhelming. Like, oh, how am I supposed to keep going with the slides that I have planned and the things that I've got popping into my head, but then also do justice to all the beautiful stuff going on over here and going back and forth. And the truth is you can't, right? I can't do that right now. Um, and you can't do that right now too, if you're getting the same kind of engagement with students. And so maybe uh, you just gotta like say, you know what, I'm gonna get to what I can and I'm gonna try to find value in wherever I can during this. 
but I also have to just kind of reserve the right to kind of stick with whatever my schedule is and stick with my agenda and stick with my time frame and my time limits. Um, so, but that's not my way of saying stop um, sharing stuff because it's, it's gold. And I know you all have, uh, you're all able to read these comments. And so a lot of it's for each other. And so feel free to keep leaving stuff and say the same with students. Hey, if you have a, a comment about what we're talking about and it's interesting, definitely leave it in the comments because then your classmates can read it while I continue to do whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, all right, here we go, next. Uh, tips to share, yes, everything has been tips to share. So feel free to, to leave any tips on here. Um, uh, I'm gonna share a couple Zoom or uh, a couple um, activities in just a bit. So I want to talk about direct instruction though right now, um, because whatever grade level you teach, there there's obviously a level of direct instruction when doing these Zoom meetings or virtual meetings. We are presenting ideas to students. Like I said earlier, I think Zoom is a great place to introduce broad ideas, and then in small group, it's a great place um, to like kind of get more into the nitty gritty and get into the detail. You know, where you can do reading practice, writing practice, math practice, but the direct instruction with a whole group really needs to be um, about getting a big idea across. And, and that's because direct instruction um, is, it should be that for a physical classroom as well. You know, in a physical space, when you're with your students in person, when we give lectures or direct instruction, when we're actually, whether it's up front or in the middle, wherever, and we're doing the talking and our students are listening and writing or doing some other activities that we have planned while we're doing that direct instruction, that should really only big be for big ideas, introducing major concepts. Um, if it's about the nitty gritty, if we're getting into too much detail on those big things, it's too hard to hold on to students' engagement and actually have them learn. Um, and I wanna talk about that a little bit more. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip this slide here. So I, I think when we're doing direct instruction, um, in a Zoom meeting, we still have to apply the best practices, the things that work well when we're with students presenting live. Um, we just we should still use those best practices, maybe even more so in a Zoom virtual space. Um, you know, for for instance, still use storytelling and enthusiasm. I know it's weird to be in front of a camera. It's still weird for me. You know, I make videos all the time back there, and and I and I try to like. And I, and I put up a camera and I've got lights and I make it like this big thing. And, and it's really odd because I get into this emotion and passion and I get into it and I lean and I, and I, my eyes get big and my inflection changes. And yet I'm just talking to like a metal and plastic device in front of me that's filming me. Even right now, I don't get to have any of that audience interaction that I would if I was talking in person, if I was speaking somewhere, if I was with students. And, and so it feels even weird now talking to a computer like this, even though I know that there's people out there listening to me. And so like when you're with your students, you might feel that same kind of awkward uh, disconnect at, and, and you might feel like, oh, I don't wanna be too enthusiastic. It feels a little weird to be sitting in my basement or at my dining room table and, and to tell big long stories or to get really en enthusiastic and passionate about something. But here's the truth about the digital space. And I've learned this and it's taken me a few years to really let this set in is that people still want you to be passionate, even if it's in a virtual space. People still want you um, to entertain them. Pe in a virtual space, people still want you uh, to, to feed off of your energy. And I, and I really believe that we can still transfer our energy to others, even if it's through um, the internet and, and a camera and, the, and just, kind of a platform like this, I still think it's possible. And I think it's what our students really want from you. Um, and, I, and I think it's true when we're in person too. Sometimes we feel like, oh, I have to tone it down because this is an academic environment. No, people want passion. People want enthusiasm. People want to hear good stories and still do that. Still do that even if you don't get to hear your students talking back to you. Even if it's just a comment bar here on the right, know that it's people want it. We want it, students want it. Um, and so still be enthusiastic and passionate about what you're talking about. Still geek out with students uh, and just and let it kind of come out. I think students will really appreciate it. Just like you know, anytime you've been around a teacher who just students seem to love to listen to and love to hear stories from, and you know, it's somebody that can actually take the boring lecture and make it something engaging. That's because they were unafraid of letting their passion show. Um, and so this is really direct instruction 101 anyway, but especially in the Zoom spaces, allow yourself to still be excited about what you're teaching. 
Um, I know that this whole crisis is just bombarded with difficulty and challenges and anxiety and stress, um, but you are still a teacher and you are still an expert at what you teach. You still teach your subject matter better than most people ever could dream of teaching it. And so still be excited about teaching it on here. And if you don't feel that excitement, I would give, I would challenge you to spend some time figuring, kind of helping yourself rediscover what do you like to do? How do you like to engage your students? What is it about this subject matter that got you excited about it in the first place? And how can you bring that same passion and excitement to a virtual space like this? Um, but also, you know, this is also just more direct instruction 101, but I think it's more important than ever in the Zoom space is no more than 15 minutes without breaking up time. Um, so a group of researchers did this study uh, where they gave um, a one hour lecture to this panel of students. Like, so it was their research group. They did a one hour study and then they gave a multiple choice test directly following this one hour lecture that they gave. gave. And they were expecting the, the students to get the most answers right about the test from information that was presented in the final five minutes of the lecture. So they assumed like, yeah, that's going to be the freshest right before they took the multiple choice test. I bet they're going to learn the most from the last five minutes. And it turns out they learned the least from the last five minutes of a one hour lecture. And they learned the most from the first five minutes of the lecture. So 55 minutes earlier is when they actually heard that information. And that's what students retain the most. And then they forgot most of it. In fact, the same research study found out that the human brain has the attention span. You can hold people's attention with direct instruction in a lecture for about 15 to 17 minutes. And any learning that happens after 15 to 7 minutes is essentially forgotten. It does not stick with the short or long-term memory. Meaning you have about 15 minutes with your group of students at any age, including college, by the way. You have about 15 minutes before people will start to disengage. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind in the Zoom space. If we go on talking for too long without breaking it up, without some type of interaction, without having a class discussion or showing a video or having some type of physical activity, you will lose the attention of your audience. And that is in a Zoom space, but that's also in, in a physical space as well. And so as we are planning direct instruction on here, just make sure that you keep it under 15 minutes or, you know, maybe you go 10, 15 minutes and then you say, okay, uh, I want you, we're going to put you into breakout rooms, which, you know, if you're using Zoom, there is that capability. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms and I'm going to pop in to each of these breakout rooms and I want you to talk about what you've heard so far. Or I'm going to talk, I want you to talk about what, you, what questions you have with each other. I want you to break it up and then we're all going to return back to the room and I'm going to keep going with what I was doing. That breaks it up. That kind of like shakes the listener, the audience so that they can re-engage again and keep going. This is so important to remember. I mean, how many of us have sat in those lectures before, or you, maybe you've been to a conference and you heard a speaker going on and on or a professor in college who just would talk for an hour straight and you are expected to just sit there and listen to it all. Um, yet our brains can't do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we have to absolutely stick to some of these best practices. Oops, wrong way. Um, best practices as we are speaking. We also should be using visuals and they don't have to be like super dynamic visuals, but if you are going to talk against some direct instruction, which by the way, I believe still has value in our world. You know, I'm, when I first got into teaching, um, I was all about project-based learning, which I still am. It's all about experiential, hands-on, um, kinesthetic learning where students are solving real problems and collaborating and creating with their hands, doing all this stuff. I'm still a major believer in that. And I used to swear off direct instruction like, oh, we need to kill the lecture. We need to get rid of, um, you know, anybody talking up front. Um, but then I've been doing this a while and, and I realized, wait a minute, there's still value in telling stories. There's still value in presenting big ideas that get a big general concept across that inspires or engages someone or, or informs them so that they can go and dig in um, to the nitty gritty so that they can dig into whatever the task is. There's still value in direct instruction, but there are parameters that have to be stuck to. You know, one of them is the 15 minute rule. Another is making sure that we have some type of visuals. Um, and you know, for here, like even just today, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm kind of breaking my rule of talking too long, but at least we have this comment bar where you can do some other things that break your attention up. Um, but even today I have visuals and, and they're not dynamic, but they're at least something for you to do other than listening. 
right? You're able to see me and my hand gestures are a way of communicating, which is something that you can do. I'm communicating with that. You're also able to see my slides. That's able to activate a different portion of your brain. And so you're doing more than just active listening because let's be honest, active listening is difficult. It's hard. It's, it, it's hard to do as adults and it's even harder to do for students, especially if they are at home and they are look, watching your Zoom meeting when they also have Fortnite playing on their phone right next to them and you can't monitor that. Or maybe it's extra difficult because they're at home and they've got a bunch of younger siblings running around and they've got the, the responsibility of taking care of them all day while their mom and dad is at work or whatever their circumstances is. And you have this enormous task of keeping their attention. Um, and so we've got to still use these best practices uh, now more than ever, but especially in the classroom too. Um, it's, it's really important that we're doing the things uh, to keep our students engaged and in whatever it is that we're teaching. So take advantage of breakout rooms. You know what I mean? I think this is a great space to break up some of that direct instruction. You know, telling students like, hey, get into this room, um, have this discussion, here's what I want you to do. Maybe have a list of norms for breakout rooms as well and introduce those every time. Hey guys, we're gonna get into breakout rooms. Remember some of the agreements we had that when we go into breakout rooms, we're gonna stay on task. Maybe we'll give 30 seconds to reacquaint with everybody. Uh, somebody's going to be a timekeeper and make sure that we stick to that. Um, whatever it is, here's your roles when we go into breakout rooms. But take advantage of some of this. And if you don't um, have Zoom, I saw somebody on here said they use Google Meet. Um, oh, Brian says, those using Google Meet, if you search up extensions for meetings, there are some that try to replicate Zoom setup. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, because Derek said, I wish Google Meet had the Zoom options. It's so much more limited. Okay, so that's good, Brian. Um, I'll dig into that as well. And if I can find instructions or specific extensions, um, I'll send it out in the email when I send this video and any resources we talk about. Uh, because breakout rooms are awesome. You know, I just did one the other day and um, it was just so much more productive. You know, when you're in a group of 30 people, and you are, you know, you're trying to learn, but you've got 30 other people and you're a teacher and you're, you're trying to get all 30 of those kids to engage in some way. It can be difficult. But if you say, OK, we're going to get into groups of four and we're going to have these conversations about whatever it is we're talking about. Maybe it's book chats. Maybe maybe in the big group we say, OK, everybody, we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Here is this one theme that we're talking about. Let me talk about theme and what we should look for. OK, now we're going to get into breakout rooms and I want you as a group to give examples and talk to each other about where you saw this theme take place, okay? Go to your breakout rooms and then you send them all there and then you can actually, at least on Zoom, you can hop in and uh, and, and contribute or listen or, and, and take notes or uh, you know do formative assessments, engage where students are at. So, I mean, it just isn't, I, sometimes you just gotta be like, wow, this is crazy technology that we have. <laughs> like, and it's only getting better. Um, so take advantage of those. Uh, and then lastly, I want to talk about indirect instruction is to embrace pauses and silence. Um, and this is a hard one, at least for me, because I sometimes get this pressure like, oh, I've got to fill every moment that I have students. They're going to lose. I'm going to lose their attention. They're going to get bored. They're going to pull out their phones if I start, if I go with too many breaks or pauses or silence. But this is something that we just have to get used to in the Zoom world is sometimes it's just awkward. And I don't think that awkwardness will ever go completely away. You know what I mean? I think there will always be an aspect, and this is just an opinion, but I think there will always be some aspect of awkwardness when we're doing a Zoom meeting or any type of webinar or something like this. And so we have to just embrace it and realize that this is just part of the new normal, that, that there's times where it just there's a pause or where you need to collect yourself. Or, you know, even today, <laughs> I should have just done it. Um, but I, you know, I'm guilty of some of these things too. I didn't want to embrace the pause, but like my kids were like stomping up there and I could hear them. And, uh, and I really like, it just distracted me. Even right now, as I'm thinking about it, I'm distracted. And so what I should have done is like, hold on one second. Okay. Sorry. I had to deal with a little bit of noise. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay. It's fine. We're all human. This is, this isn't, I, I was with a friend yesterday. He's a pastor. And uh, he's having to film all of his um, sermons right now. And he's putting them online. Um, uh, AJ, Cheryl, how you doing, man? Uh, so he made this, uh, he's just talking. He's like, you know, I'm just learning that people are actually okay with imperfections. He's like, like, people actually even appreciate it. 
He said, you know, the first few weeks of like filming my sermons and putting them online, uh, I felt like I had to edit everything down. And anytime I messed something up, I would go and edit it out or I'd cut it out. Or if there was a pause where I had to collect myself, I would do that. And he said, I've actually found in the last few weeks, if I mess up, I just call it out and or I try to re-explain or I go back to where I was or I just kind of give myself a pause and embrace some silence and recollect myself or look at my notes and I get back to it. And uh, I just like, man, that is so applicable for teachers, right? Like this is weird. And so I think we all have to hear that as well. I know I'm hearing it. We're okay having a little bit of pause and silence. By the way, boredom is okay too. If students are a little bored as you're collecting yourself, that's okay. You know what I mean? Like that, that's absolutely okay. Life is often very boring. Right. And, and they've got to learn how to deal with that as well and, and realize that this is just part of the new virtual space. So um, lean in to uh, the, the pauses and silence. They can actually be beneficial. And, I'm, and when I'm saying this, that's a reminder for myself as well. Oh, and then allow students to present. I think Zoom is a great place where students can learn to share with each other, not necessarily making it obligatory and requiring that they present. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, we'll talk about some joyful challenges you can do with students in just a minute. But, you know, like having them present something in their house. You know, if you're doing a scavenger hunt, allow them to talk about what they found or what they did. You know, my uh, daughter's preschool teacher the other day um, asked, like, what's something new that's happened for you lately? And each one of the little kids got to go along and, and share about something new. And my little daughter, who, you know, can be very shy on, on the screen, was, like, really excited to talk about, like, um, you know, the, the tree house that we're working on in our backyard and she was talking about it and presenting and uh, it was great. It was a wonderful confidence building activity for her. Like I could see her like straighten up a little bit and I could see a reaction to this afterwards. She was proud of herself. And, and so while we still, uh, we don't have that in-person meeting, we can still teach students how to collaborate and, and communicate and, and kind of get over some of those fears. Uh, you know, when, when we are communicating in a virtual audience like this, we, we still have an audience, you know what I mean? Like our virtual space like this, we still have an audience. It's still public speaking. Um, and so I think we can utilize that too. I think that can be a really valuable use of time. Um, Brian says, I like the idea of favorite songs. What, what was the idea? Oh, everybody's saying I like the idea. I can't find it. Oh man, I'm pausing too long. I'm embracing the silence. Oh, I can't find it. If somebody can remind me, or if somebody can tell me what the, the favorite songs thing is, I'm super um, intrigued. Um, Amanda says, we are doing a virtual awards day for families, and I'm working on finding applause soundtrack to play in between announcing each award because those pauses are going to be so weird. Yes, they are. Yes, 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 they are. Um, yeah, I like that. And maybe you can play music in between too with families um, if it's a little bit more of an event kind of thing. Um, but then also just like, we all know it, you know, everybody, I mean, most people are doing some type of virtual meeting right now, uh, connecting with others, even like when we chat, when we FaceTime with friends at night right now, as we keep our social distance, you know, there's sometimes where we kind of run out of things to say for a minute and we sit there a little awkward, but it's like, yeah, we're all just used to it. And so I don't, I mean, I like the idea of doing the applause or music, um, but also, uh, also feel free not to do that if you don't feel like it, because it's just, this is what it looks like. This is something that we're all learning right now. Um, yeah, Julie says, I've been thinking about breakout rooms as I'm afraid of them. Maybe a student leader for each group and then popping in or letting know the groups must report out. I love that. So having some type of accountability when doing group, group breakout rooms, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they are nerve wracking because like, well, what are they going to be talking about? Are they actually going to stay on task? Are they, are they doing anything? And the answer is no, they're not always going to be doing what you want them to do. Right. It, it, but that's the same with any class. You know, when you have, say, to students, hey, guys, turn and talk. They're not always going to turn and talk or not. Right. And, and there's some things that are out of our control and you can't control how they do in those breakout rooms. But you can use some accountability measures. Hey, one of you is a group leader. This time it's your job to make sure that everybody gets going. Or maybe you're the moderator of the discussion. I'm going to send you the discussion questions independently. And then I want you to share them with your group. You know what I mean? Giving some power and not power, but some leadership to students um, and empowering them to do that. That might be helpful. Having them report out 
on what they shared. Maybe having uh, different roles. One person's going to record their conversation. One person is going to be the moderator and one of them is going to be the presenter. And so after your breakout, we're going to come back to the group room and then you're going to say, okay, all the presenters, I want you to talk about uh, what your small groups actually talked about. You know, giving a little bit of accountability in that way is a fantastic idea. All right. Uh, what time do we have? So we have 11 minutes left. Yeah, record meetings. I already talked about that, but definitely record your meetings if you can and post them so students who are not able to make it can still um, connect in some way and can still, you know, as an equity issue, making sure that all of our students have access to instruction. Um, so recording meetings is a fantastic idea. Uh, and there's some different tools you can do that. Um, if you're the, you know, Zoom allows you to record it. I don't know about Google Meet. Uh, but there's also a, a Google extension called Screencastify. I've got it on my computer. I don't know if I can share my screen right now. Oh, I'm going to try this. All right, I'm sharing my screen. And it looks weird. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. Let me see. I'm doing this live, I'm nervous. So Screencastify, this is just like an app that you get added to your toolbar. It's loading. I wish I had like an applause sound right now that could fill this awkwardness. Um, and so what I can do is I can record, I'm not gonna do it right now, but I can record what's going on on my screen at the very moment. So if you have Google, you do have the ability to record your screen. So you just hit record, and it records everything that happens in the screen, which is an awesome thing, by the way. Or like, let's say, this is a, a sweet thing I've figured out. Um, if your students uh, have YouTube blockers, or well, I guess they might not, but um, if they have any, like if they can't see a certain video or you can't share a link or um, you wanna make sure they see it, you can actually go to a video. I don't know if this is legal, but sorry. Uh, you can record a video on YouTube um, and then send that file or upload that file I'm using Screencastify. It's great. So like when I make videos, um, you know, sometimes I just want a video. I'll go and screencast an, an actual video and then take that and send it. So anyway, that's a cool tool. I'm going to go back to the slideshow. Can you see my slideshow? Can you guys see my slides right now? Okay, here we go. I can't, I, I can't, oh no, you cannot see them, okay. Oh, start, let's see if that does it, now you can. All right, moving on, uh, Google Voice, I just wanted to drop this, I know we're talking about Zoom meetings, but Google Voice, you can actually, it's free and you get your own phone number on Google Voice and you can call students through that. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, you know, if you're doing phone calls to students or parents, you can actually make phone calls on Google Voice and then they won't have access to your phone number, uh, which I once made the mistake of giving high schoolers my phone number um, for something project related and I would get um, ridiculous prank calls all night long from then on out forever, still do. So I don't like giving up my phone number um, to students or their parents, um, but Google Voice is a great option. So. Anyway, I just wanted to drop that in there. It's free. You get it on Google Voice. All right. Uh, let's talk about relationship building, and then we will wrap this thing up. Uh, I think it's wonderful to start every single Zoom meeting um, with some version of this, which is tell me something good. Uh, and, and this is where I would just say to students, all right, everybody, what's good? And, and I just let them go around, and I might say, okay, you only have five seconds to share. And I do this in the actual classroom as well. Um, because it can go way too long otherwise. You have five seconds to tell me something good uh, that's going on in your life, and then they just go along um, and share something good. It's just encouraging. It's a way of kind of bringing back some normalcy. So tell me something good, or you could call it good things, whatever it is. Um, yeah, Hong says, screen recording other people's YouTube videos is not a good idea. That's probably true. Um, sending the link. Yeah, it's it's probably just easier to send the link as well. So. I retract my statement. Um, so tell me something good. Um, schedule small group check-ins. Yes. You know, just make time for this. It's, it's important. And when I say check-ins, yeah, check in on the content where they're at academically. But also, what if you did small group check-ins where it was just like, hey, I just want to check in and see how you're doing. 
right? Like, and, and, and maybe the students will go deep with you about how they're actually doing. Maybe some of them won't go deep with you and how they're doing, but they'll, they'll at least know that somebody's checking in on them. You know, I mean, I've, I've just read disturbing statistics about how many students are in some serious struggles right now. And, and, you know, just dealing with, you know, emotional and physical abuse and all the things that are going on at home. And they're saying one of the biggest problems with all of it is they no longer have the support system that they're used to having. Um, you know, they don't have the teachers that they get to see every day. They don't have anybody checking in with them. They don't have their counselors. They don't have the administrators. They don't have their coaches. They, they don't have these people who are constants in their lives. And so if just once a week, you could just check in with students and, and maybe it's impossible to do one-on-ones with students. I pr- it probably is for most people, but if you could do three or four students, um, uh, you know, or maybe five students or whatever, whatever's manageable for you to just be able to check in and say, Hey, just want to check in for five minutes and see how everybody's doing. Um, and then just kind of maybe have some, some time frames for it. Somebody said on here, how do you have time for all of these meetings? You might not. Uh, you might not have time for all of these meetings. Um, I, I saw I I saw one school is doing this to where each grade they have one teacher um, is assigned uh, to a certain group of students, and so not every teacher in the school is doing their check-ins with every single one of their students. And so, like, let's say, um, yeah, let's say a, a boy named Tommy. Uh, it's always Tommy or Janie or Timmy, right? But let's say Tommy um, is assigned to Mr. Smith. And, and t- Tommy, all of his teacher check-ins, um, uh, maybe it's an academic check-in, social check-in, emotional check-in, whatever it is, they're all with Mr. Smith. Even though Tommy might have five other teachers, the only one he does it wa- with is Mr. Smith. And the only students that Mr. Smith has are the ones that are on his own caseload or whatever his um, group of students are. And that kind of spreads it out. So like not every single teacher is having to deal, with, or deal has having to interact and connect at that deep level with every single student because it's just not possible or feasible. And that's another way to go about working with parents as well. Um, you know, I've, I've heard from a lot of parents who are just overwhelmed by hearing from all of their kids' teachers. You know, like my kids, they're, they're early ed and so they only have one teacher um, or they have one primary teacher and then elective teacher, but they're getting all their communications from their primary teacher. But you know, if you have a, a middle schooler, or a high schooler, or maybe some elementary, um, you know, your kids, your students have six different teachers. And so if all six of those teachers are scheduling small group check-ins, that's a lot of different check-in meetings. Um, Or if they're all sending parent emails, that's a lot of emails they're getting. And so it might be helpful. And and I know this isn't all up to us, but to suggest that idea about what if we broke it up this way to make it more manageable. Um, My daughter's high school teachers check in with their third period students. Love it. That's a fantastic idea. Amanda says Ed Puzzle. I've never heard of this. Ed Puzzle, E D P U Z Z L E, is one of my favorite tools to use for watching videos and making them interactive for students. You can monitor their activity and make the video stop at specific times. I love that. All right. Um, joyful challenges, and and I would love for people to just dump any ideas that you already have, but you know, just kind of having fun stuff going on too. Yeah. We've got academic stuff, but if we can at least slide some fun things for students to do as well, that makes it fun to be in your Zoom meeting. Uh, maybe not always, but you know, having joyful challenges, like whether it's show and tell or doing scavenger hunts, you can be really creative with what your scavenger hunts look like. You know, go find something in your house that's shaped like a rhombus. Go find something in your house that has this certain texture. Go something in your house, you know, if it's older students, go find something in your house that's a simile or a metaphor for something else, Um, you know, whatever it is, you know, having them go and physically do something that they have to run and get back and and get to present on, Um, you know, I do a talent show, Kahoot, if that's a wonderful tool, I love Kahoot, and it just gamifies formative assessment, essentially, and so, you know, you can still do things like that with students where, you know, if you're going to quiz them, or you're going to assess where they're at, or you're going to do just something like fun trivia, you know, Kahoot is a great tool where they can all be on and have fun doing that. Um, but just different things that are just kind of bringing some more joy to the classroom experience. Um, Crystal does, would you rather questions? Two truths and a lie. I love it. Jill um, does mindfulness activities to break up instruction. That is a beautiful idea. 
You know, as we talked about earlier in direct instruction, you only have so many minutes before you lose students' engagement, especially on Zoom. And so what if you said, okay, guys, I'm going to talk for 10 minutes about this, and then we're going to do a little break, and we're going to do some meditation. And I'm going to play some music, and I want you to follow along with this meditation. Or uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to do some yoga, right? Like, that's fun. That's memorable. That's something that they're going to remember long after this crisis is over. Oh, yeah. My teacher used to have us do yoga in the middle of her lessons. Um, Christina is still doing spirit days. I love it. Wearing sunglasses, hats, favorite jerseys, school colors. Derek, we did something. Uh, go find something in your house challenge. It was awesome. I delivered a pizza prize to the top three points earners of a challenge. That is sweet. Um, that is fun. Delivering pizza to the winners. They will never, ever forget that, Derek. For their entire lives, they will never forget the day their teacher dropped pizza off at their house. I love it. Um, uh, Elena is doing Never Have I Ever. That, never Have I Ever. Yeah, that's the right one where you have to like hold up numbers. Um, guess my number using the whiteboard. They can only ask me yes or no questions and use math terms. Even odd, greater than, less than is the digit. So Casey has a great one on there. I don't know if it makes sense if I'm reading it, but I love that idea. Um, so chat, just keep dumping ideas. This is fantastic. And here's another thing about, and this is always goes for teaching, but especially now steal great ideas, take them, you know what I mean? Do them yourself. Uh, there's, there, there's so many people in the exact same boat as you. I think this webinar is a great example of the fact that there are people from all over the world who are figuring this out as we go. Nobody's got it all figured out. So everybody's figuring it out and everybody's figuring out different things that are working for them. And so keep sharing them. Put ideas out there. Get ideas from other people. Don't feel like you have to come up with everything. I did. That's what I, I had a slide I was going to go back to earlier. You know, with direct instruction, I'm going back, I'm going back. All right. And then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, oh, I don't know if this is worth it just to have a slide. Embrace the pause. Embrace the pause. Embrace the. See, this wasn't worth it. All right. See, all that. Um, use pre existing video and audio lessons if they're more effective. You know, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to teach my students about photosynthesis and I've got to do it in a Zoom meeting and I've got to find a way to make it engaging. And normally in my classroom, I would have a plant with me and I would like really get into it. And I would have students come up and touch the plant and we'd pull out microscopes and look closely. And then, you know, I mean, I would do all these things and we would grow beans together and we'd do all these things that we can't do anymore. Although I think it would be kind of cool if you still had students grow plants and present them. But maybe like, oh, it's not going this the way I want it to. Well, guess what? There's already some great videos out there on photosynthesis and that are well explained and they have great visuals and people put a lot of thought into them. There's nothing wrong with you using them. You know what I mean? Like, don't feel this pressure to create everything right now. You know, if you're having a tough week and you're like, I just, I just don't feel like reading to my students today. Reading Rainbow exists. Send the link to that. You know what I mean? Maybe watch it together as a class. Say, okay, for our classroom meeting today, we're all going to watch this video I found, a crash course video. I love crash course videos. We're going to watch a crash course video together, and then we're going to have a discussion afterwards. Or we're going to watch a cra cla crash course video, then I'm going to introduce what the activity is for this week, and we'll log off, and you can go do that activity. Whatever it is, use what's out there. Take ideas. It feels usually a bad word, but I think in the teaching context, steal Awesome ideas. If they're an idea that's working for somebody else, maybe it'll work for you. And it'll make your life easier and it'll make um, just instruction better for your students. All right. I'm going towards the end. Don't leave me. What time is it? 1032. We are at an hour. So I think it is time to wrap it up. So please just feel free to share things that you're doing. Um, as, as far as direct instruction goes, I am just about done making an online course. Uh, which I am really, really, really excited about. Um, it's all about how do we do strong direct instruction. It's kind of, I once had this thought like, you know, what if we reclaimed what it means to give a lecture? Like so many lectures are, you know, lectures have such a bad rap to them. They're boring. They're too long, too much information. They don't engage me. They don't work. And I think that's because they're not done well a lot of the times. I don't think it's the actual storytelling that's that uh, is a bad idea. It's just about how it's done. And so I put a lot of time into thinking about how do we craft memorable lectures? How do we tell really good stories? How do we make the learning stick? Um, so I made this whole online course 
um, and it'll be coming out in just a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in it, uh, feel free. I, I put a link up here in the top of the chat where you can just put your name down and whenever it's out, I'll just let you know that it's available. Um, but I'm just really excited about that and I thought this would be a good place to let you know. Um, I'm pretty pumped about it. Uh, other than that, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I just, I love connecting with you and, and I'm just honored that you would spend your Saturday morning with me. Um, just having this conversation. Uh, this was so good. I've got so many more ideas myself that, that I'm excited to go try out and I'm just inspired. I mean, cause just look on here, we've got hundreds of people, uh, that are committed to doing this, that, that are committed to putting in the time and sharing ideas and not giving up. Because that's what we can't do. We can do a lot of things. We can give ourselves grace. We can take vacation time. We, we need to give ourselves breaks. We need to relieve some pressure. There's a lot we can do, but one of them is not give up. We got to stick with this because it's important. Um, the work you are doing with your students right now is going to have an impact on them and their communities and their society, our society, uh, more than you know. And so thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, thanks for your passion. Um, and thanks for contributing on here. This was great. Um, and we'll do it again soon. Uh, and thanks to everybody that's chiming in right now. All right. Uh, oh, you can't see the link. I'll put it in again. Here's the link to uh, my course thing. And I'm also, oh, oh, also, 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 I will send out an email tomorrow that has this video and any resources that I collect that we found on here um, and a certificate. Uh, so you can get PD credit. Um, so in an hour of PD, I'll also send that as well. So anyway, thanks so much. Um, feel free to check out that course. Feel free to get in touch with me. And uh, I can't wait to connect with you all again soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a phenomenal Saturday. Don't think about teaching now, though. You had your meeting. You had your PD. Now close that laptop and don't go grade papers. Don't go plan activities. Go take a nap or go on a hike or do something other than school for a little bit. All right. Bye, everyone. Oh, and I'll leave this on for a minute. Uh, I'm going to walk away from my computer because it would be awkward, but I'll leave this on. So if anybody wants to go uh, browse through the comments a little bit um, and find any ideas that have been posted on there. But as far as everything else goes, this meeting is adjourned. All right. Bye, everybody. I'm back. Now I'm gone.